Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and I am doing a different kind of video than I usually do. I'm, I'm home at my house, and when I got home today, there was a box in the mail, and inside it was my textbook. This, today, is the first chance I've had to look um, at the actual printed version of my book. I tried to do a live unboxing video. This is what uh, my kids watch on YouTube. They watch people open up toys and and uh, get them out of boxes. So I tried that and it was a total fail because the internet was really laggy and so the whole video is blurry. But if you really want to see it, I'll put a link to the live video so you can see the uh, excitement. The moment I open the box, if that's exciting for you, cool. But I thought I would do a better high quality version and actually show you what the book looks like inside it and then I'll uh, take some, uh, some screen recordings to show what the actual uh, pages look like. I can't tell you how excited I am because I poured so much time and effort into making this book. It took me about a year of pretty hard work to write. I was up late at night, up early in the morning. Um, I was really excited when Elizabeth Montgomery gave me this opportunity. I was also kind of nervous because I didn't know how to write a book. But in the end, after a lot of time and hard work and a lot of Photoshop, this is what we got. Here's a trichoblastoma. So when I was writing the book, um, the team at Innovative uh, Science Press, uh, they said, oh, we need to make some changes to the photos. And I said, oh, I don't know. And they said, Dr. Gardner, trust us. The pictures will look good. Your book will look beautiful. I am so happy to say that. I, I cannot tell you how pleased I am with how these turned out. And I'm really glad that I listened to the wisdom of people who have a lot more experience than I do at publishing and making printed pages look good. They, uh, these turned out uh, better than like my wildest dreams. They look so vivid and crisp. And again, this is not a textbook review. I'm totally biased. I, I'm, this is like my baby, you know, after my three daughters this is my fourth baby, I guess. Um, so yeah, I, I can't tell you how amazing this looks to me. I, I'm, and I have really high expectations and I was worried, what if I open it up and it doesn't look good? No, the team, they are absolute pros. They made it look amazing. And uh, yeah, it was a labor of love. It took a lot of work, but really it's um, uh, all of you around the world uh, on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube who tell me that the teaching material that I post helps you, uh, makes your practice easier, makes your training easier, and most importantly, that it helps you to take care of your real life patients. I mean, to me as an educator, that's the reason I do it, right? I want to help sick people and I want to help all of my colleagues have easier, better practices and help the sick people that they take care of too. So um, this book, these are the, again, this is the first time today, just this afternoon uh, or this evening when I got home from work, this book was here. It's the first time I'm seeing it. These are called, I guess, advanced copies that come from the printer. The remainder of the copies will be out sometime in September and you can pre-order it now from Innovative Science Press from their website. I'll put a link um, down below in the video description. Uh, you can click there and pre-order and it'll ship out in September. Um, and to my understanding, they will ship uh, pretty much worldwide. So, um, uh, But if you have any questions, you can go through their website and email them and they'll um, help you out with that. They're a really amazing team. So I, I have so many people to thank. My wife, um, my who I could never have gotten to the place I am in my career or my life without her support and her love and uh, her constantly saying, hmm, maybe don't send that email till tomorrow or so many things she's done to help me um, to help me become the best version of myself that I can be and to, to give me so much time and support helping with the kids and everything else while I wrote this book early mornings and late nights. Um, my three daughters who make life fun and joyful and exciting every day, all of my amazing mentors, my incredible partner at work, Sarah Shaylin, MD, PhD, my, my better half at work who is so smart, has taught me so many things and has been so supportive of all the, the trips I do and the time I spend um, doing educational things. Uh, despite all the busy stuff she has in her practice, she, I couldn't have ever asked for a better colleague than her and I've been so happy to work with her. And, um, and all of the many mentors I had in Dermpath and in every part of pathology and training, um, I just, there's too many of them to name. I'm afraid I would leave someone out. But anyway, thank you all. I'm, I'm really excited, as you can tell. And I just wanted to share this moment of excitement with all of you because it's really, it's really the support and, um, and um, the support of all of you that really pushed me to get this thing done and make it happen. And, and again, thanks to Liz Montgomery for making this awesome press, uh, innovative science press to print books like this that are cheaper, that are soft cover and that are practical and aimed at trainees. And that's the heart of what I do. And so I, thought it was so perfect and I was so happy to be able to to co-author the soft tissue survival guide with her and Alicia Ware and then now to be able to write this Durham Path book and I'm so happy to be a part of of what they're doing because I think it's amazing so be sure to check out all the other things that that Innovative Science Press has to offer all right now let's take a look 
inside the book a little closer up so you can see um, a sneak peek and then um, once you have a copy of your own you'll get to see the whole thing. Okay, so here's the table of contents. A boring place to start, right? But the reason I wanted to point this out is here's the approach I took to the book. I have basics at the beginning, some random disclaimers, but also how to approach a skin biopsy, how to read the requisition sheet, how to actually build rapport with dermatologists to help you um, learn what, what helps them and uh, help the patient. And uh, I went over some tips about grossing histology, whether or not to report margin status, things like that. And then I went into another area that I guess is a little different than a lot of books, I think, is there are a lot of miscellaneous curiosities that confuse people starting out in Dermpath. And then I also talk about funny looking keratinocytes. And that's my way to kind of sum up. Keratinocytes sometimes look weird. And again, this is something that will confuse you. Sometimes they have vacuoles that make them look, uh, get confused with melanocytes. And I have an easy way to tell those apart. There are a variety of other skin specific diseases that have the keratinocytes look unusual and learning about those is really helpful. And then I go into the typical um, derm path things like seborrheic keratoses and actinic keratoses, squamous cell carcinoma, etc. All right, let's talk about, so show some examples of miscellaneous curiosities. So here's an example of the true hemorrhage on the left with the scattered red cells versus these sheets of blood that you see that are just bleeding that happened after the biopsy was performed. Here's an easy way to tell apart myofibroblasts on the left from smooth muscle on the right. See this wispy little purple cytoplasm and the wavy collagen fibers in between? That's a sure sign that you're dealing either with myofibroblasts or fibroblasts and not with smooth muscle. Really simple to tell this apart on H&E without stains once you know the trick. Um, this is a great example of vacuolation artifact in keratinocytes. And when keratinocytes have vacuoles, they have naked nuclei that are, are totally alone and naked in the center of the vacuole and the cytoplasms around the outside. And uh, it's really important to not confuse that with melanocytes because otherwise you might think this is melanoma. Um, these are melanocytes. When they have a vacuole, they also get vacuole artifacts but their vacuoles are on the outside and their cytoplasm clings to the nucleus and sticks to it. So this is the type of uh, thing that I try to teach in the book. Stuff that, that people get confused uh, with from, from my experience as a teacher and also even from what I've seen other practicing pathologists sometimes get confused with when it comes to derm path. Uh, inflammatory dermatoses. This is kind of the bane of everyone's existence when it comes to derm path, I think. And even for me, I'm a trained dermatopathologist, but some of the cases I struggle with the most are still inflammatory diseases, rashes that I have trouble classifying. So I try to give a lot of practical tips in this, um, in this chapter about how to approach this, even if you're not an expert at dermatology and don't know about all the different unusual types of dermatoses, you can still be helpful to the dermatologist. And I go into how you can do that in this chapter, what kind of wording and terminology will help them sort out the differential. The first thing I do is I go through a table where I lay out the different inflammatory patterns, what the key features of those are. So spongiotic pattern has intraepidermal edema, which is what we call spongiosis. Also usually has lymphocytes in the epidermis and typically has perikeratosis and serum in the corneal layer. And then I give some example diseases that are kind of typical examples of spongiotic pattern, eczematous dermatitis, contact, all of those. This is not an exhaustive table. Um, it's just a list to give you an idea. When you see contact dermatitis on the dermatologist requisition sheet, they're looking for a spongiotic dermatitis. So if you see spongiotic dermatitis, then you can be very helpful to them, even if you don't know for sure if it's contact. And so I do the same thing with all the other patterns here. And here's the table uh, eight one continued, and you can see how you delve into some of the different granulomatous things, vasculitis, thrombotic vasculopathy, a really important thing to recognize in derm path. Um, it shows up here, I feel, more than in other organ systems and oftentimes associated with severe problematic systemic diseases that potentially could be lethal depending on the scenario. So real important to, to understand this. And then paniculitis, inflammation of the subcutis. Here's an example of spongiosis. And again, I really want to go into how do you know this is spongiosis? Well, there's white space between keratinocytes. You can see the desmosome spines really stretched out because of that extra white space. That white space is edema fluid. It's, it's fluid that's leaked up here and, and uh, pushed apart the keratinocytes. When you have spongiosis, you often get these big aggregates of Langerhan cells. And those aggregates, you don't want to confuse those, say, with melanocytes. Guess what? They're S100 positive. So that's why one of the reasons we don't use S100 um, when we're staining uh, the epidermis. 
but this is a good example of just kind of the basics of what sponge derm looks like. Vacuolar interface dermatitis and lichenoid interface dermatitis, these are two very, very important inflammatory patterns. A lot of different diseases in derm path can have these, and you may not be able to sort those out on a biopsy, but if you can say, yes, this is lichenoid, I don't know how to classify it further, that will help the dermatologist if they were between a lichenoid and say a psoriasiform process. So by saying, yes, it's lichenoid, you can help them rule out psoriasis and, and maybe consider lichen planus or lichenoid hypersensitivity, something like that. So even if you don't know the exact clinical, you can still do a lot of value here just by recognizing the patterns. Uh, keratinocytic or epidermal proliferations, this is the bread and butter of what we see in derm path, but some of these things still are tricky and challenging to me still to this day um, after seven years of practice. These are easy cases, seborrheic keratoses. I really wanted to show this picture just to show off the, the beautiful quality of the images in the book. And I know I'm very biased since I made the book, but um, I'm a real stickler for image quality and I worked really hard and spent I don't know how many hours um, taking pictures of the microscope and photoshopping and editing to try to make them look just right and perfect. And um, I hope once you have a copy of the book, you'll agree that the image quality is really outstanding. Um, and I'm so thankful again to the publisher for making that happen and making the printed image quality um, in some cases look even better actually than the quality I was able to make uh, digitally. I, I was blown away once I saw the printed uh, book. Um, I also try to add comments to show you this is actually what I say in my report when I'm not sure about something. So here's an example, seborrheic keratosis, when they get inflamed, sometimes they get atypical, and especially on a partial biopsy, it can be really hard to tell them apart from squamous cell carcinoma. I still struggle with this all the time. So this is an actual comment I add in my reports. I say, um, I actually have a little code for this. It's the persist code. Um, and it says if there's, there's atypia, I think it's probably reactive, but if the lesion persists, recurs, or if there's continued concern clinically, then a repeat biopsy would be recommended. So I say some variation of this when I see atypia, but I still really think it's a SEB. So I feel like sometimes it's the, the straightforward cases aren't the problem, even rare ones once you figure them out. It's these common things where there's a little bit of atypia or you can't see the whole lesion or you're not totally sure if it fits clinically and figuring out how to approach those cases is really, I think, one of the things I struggled with a lot when I started practice. So I try to give you a lot of very personal advice about how I do it, how I handle these things in my practice, how I came to a place where I was okay with, with dealing with these things. I may not be able to figure them out, but at least I know how to word it and give my dermatologist some information to go on um, so that they understand what I'm, what I'm seeing and what I'm uh, thinking. And we go through uh, classic things like hypertrophic actinic keratosis. Here's a nice example of that. But also some more um, unusual variants. This is a squamous cell carcinoma, but look at the top. It looks just like a verruca, like a wart. But then down deep at the base, there's obvious invasive squamous cell carcinoma. I see this on a regular basis, and that's why it's very dangerous, especially in an elderly sun damaged patient, to diagnose something definitively as wart when you can't see the base, because I all the time see things that look so bland and benign on the surface and are ugly and atypical and malignant down at the base. So I really try to do a lot of low power images and then also higher power images in the book, because um, low power, uh, low magnification is so important in derm path particularly, but then I do want you to see at high power, this is what you'd see. Um, and then also some unusual but but really characteristic benign things like clear cell acanthoma um, and verruciform xanthoma, which can sometimes get confused with the condyloma or, um, or verrucous carcinoma if you're not familiar with this entity. Okay, infectious diseases can happen anywhere in the body, but in the book I really tried to focus on diseases that were either specific to the skin or had unusual patterns of um, infection uh, in the skin. So here, for example, bullus and petigo. We don't see this biopsy very often, but it's really easy to recognize once you do because you have acantholysis and neutrophils in this subcorneal blister, but also you have clusters of cocci bacteria. And you don't want to confuse that with staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, which looks very different because this is not due to bacteria growing in the skin, but somewhere else. And the toxins circulate through the body and then cause acantholysis. And then the epidermal, uh, the roof of the blister, the, the stratum corneum and granular layer kind of make a blister and detach. And sometimes all you'll see is this floating roof of the blister. So really important to know about this. This sometimes is a thing we see emergently where the patient, they're concerned they might have toxic epidermal necrolysis, um, 
S-C-H-A-L-T-E-N, or maybe staff scalded skin, and being able to tell those apart is really important. Sometimes we get called on weekends um, for emergent, um, emergent uh, rush uh, cases because a kid's really sick and is sloughing off all of their skin. So this is one of those diseases that's really important to, to sort out because it's a lot easier to manage this than T-E-N in Stevens-Johnson. And here's herpes. Everyone knows the, the three M's of herpes, the multinucleation, molding, and margination. But did you know that herpes causes follicular and sebaceous gland necrosis? That's a, a very unique thing that it does sometimes in the skin. So finding necrotic sebaceous glands, start looking around for herpes. It's a really characteristic feature. Also, you tend to get not only the dirty necrosis in the ulcer at the top or the blister, but also really dense, deep, perivascular lymphocytic inflammation. That's another feature that I feel is, is kind of unique to skin um, that can make you think of herpes even if you don't see the viral chains yet. Um, here's an example on the left of tinea versicolor, which is caused by malassezia or pterosporum. But here on the right is the same organism, but this is actually just incidental uh, yeast form with no hyphae. Here you can see the hyphae. This is the spaghetti and meatballs that people like to talk about for tinea versicolor. But in, um, in normal skin, like over top of seborrheic keratoses or actinic keratoses, we see pterosporum yeast all the time, like multiple times per day I see this. I don't know, dozens of times a day. I don't even mention it in my report. So I, I go through telling you, hey, this is what this is. If you see it, know that this is normal flora, basically, and you don't need to report it. I've seen people do find these organisms, do a stain, and then send me the case in consultation wondering what kind of fungal infection was over top of this seborrheic keratosis. And I just said, no, this is just normal flora. We see it all the time. And then I also teach things like this, which are, are really subtle clues. I like to use arrows. I tried to use a lot of arrows in the book. I spent a lot of time uh, learning how to Photoshop arrows in. This is an example right here that is so important and crucial to recognize in Dermpath. This epidermis is dead. It's like ghosted out with loss of nuclei. The hair follicle is dead and there's blood in the dermis. This is ischemia, inf infarction of the skin from blood, a loss of blood flow. When you see that, you have to go figure out why is this, the skin ischemic? What's blocking the blood flow? And over here, same thing. We have ischemia, death of the eccrine coil. The eccrine coil tends to die first. It's very sensitive to hypoxia. The duct is still intact, but the secretory portion of the eccrine gland is dead. So when you see that, that's a huge important clue for hypoxia or ischemic injury, and you have to go look, are there thrombi in the vessels? Is this calciphylaxis underneath that we are just not sampling? Is there um, something else blocking the vessels? And in this case, the something else was angioinvasive fungus. And this is obviously a medical emergency, requires a phone call to the clinician. This is a terrible thing, and this often happens, unfortunately, in, in transplant patients or other immunosuppressed patients. So you can see fungus filling this vessel and actually in the act of invading out of the vessel into the dermis um, surrounding it. And other unusual infections in the skin like chromoblastomycosis, which is, these are the so-called copper pennies, these round brown um, fungal structures, which is uh, caused by a variety of different um, dermatiaceous pigment producing fungus. And what's important about this is not only recognizing the infection, but the fact that chromoblastomycosis, along with a handful of other types of fungal disease in the skin, um, can make the epidermis grow in a to become really thick and acanthotic and have a reactive atypia. So we call this pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. And if you're having a bad day, you can confuse this with squamous cell carcinoma, even though the whole process is reactive to the infection. So a real important pattern to recognize in Dermpath that deep fungal infections in the skin can cause reactive change to the epidermis that mimics squamous cell carcinoma. And then also scabies, what book on Dermpath would be complete without scabies? And again, showing you not only the scabies organism, look at this beautiful case of crusted scabies where there's numerous organisms, but also here's the, here's the adult scabies organism. Here's scabies feces or scabala, we call it, this brown little uh, nodules here. And then also eggshells, egg casings uh, from, uh, from the scabies mite. So finding any of these is definitive evidence of scabies infestation and uh, really important. I've seen scabies get missed and and I've seen scabies mimic lymphoma and all sorts of weird things. So it's really important to know about scabies and have a high index of suspicion for it in the right settings. And then other unusual diseases but that are very distinct, these are granulomatous infiltrate tracking along in a linear fashion, these linear serpiginous granulomas and their surrounding nerves. 
and this is uh, rare, but we see it depending on where you live in the world. Um, we see it only a few times a year in my practice. If you live in some parts of India um, or the Middle East, you might see this almost daily. This is leprosy, and you can see here the fight stain showing the numerous um, uh, lepre bacilli uh, in the nerve and or, or in, or around the nerve in the granulomatous infiltrates. All right, adnexal tumors are rare, but they come up from time to time, and these tend to really be confusing to people in, starting out in the path. And I tried to use a pattern-based approach to select gland tumors, and this is adapted from a paper that I wrote with um, a former fellow, uh, uh, Ed Fulton, and my former colleague, Jennifer Cayley, and we published this in archives. And here you can go and uh, look up the paper uh, if you want to see the, the paper now. I used that same kind of approach, but I put in a lot more pictures than I was able to fit into the article. Um, so, for example, here's poroma, and again, lots of arrows showing these are ductal spaces. These are dilated ductal spaces. Here's the sharp cutoff between the poroid cells and the adjacent epidermis. All of those things are clues that help me realize that this is a poroma, a benign type of sweat gland tumor. And here's spiradenoma, blue balls in the dermis, blue nodules. And then again, arrows pointing to the ductal spaces. And down here, arrows pointing to the different cell types, the dark basaloid cells, the larger pale cells, and the little lymphocytes that tend to trickle in between the tumor cells in this other, this is another form of benign sweat gland tumor. Here's cylindroma, which is just a beautiful puzzle piece pattern of nests that's very similar and related to spiradenoma. And then also some rare entities like digital papillary adenocarcinoma. These are rare but super important because they don't often look malignant and it's really easy. I've seen cases where people misdiagnosed these and it ended up causing harm to the patient and legal action. So I really want to make sure that everyone knows that even though it's rare, it's so important. If you see a papillary um, epithelial proliferation on the digits, the hands or the feet on the digits, you've got to know that this entity must be excluded and you have to know how to do that. So I go into that here because it's rare, but really bad if you miss it. And then finally, melanocytic lesions takes up, um, the book is I think 291 pages long. The melanocytic chapter I think is like 20% of the book, 20 or 25% of the whole book. And that's because melanocytic lesions are common. You see, I see numerous cases every day. They're difficult for beginners particularly because the rules of what makes benign versus malignant are kind of unusual and not intuitive for melanocytes. They, they work by different rules than a lot of other tumors in pathology. And uh, also because missing a diagnosis of melanoma is a huge problem and a mistake that no one wants to make. And so because it's such a, such a, a common type of biopsy and such a bad thing to, to miss, I really spent a lot of time going through how to tell apart melanoma from nevus and what are unusual variants of nevus and melanoma that often confuse people. Um, I mean, people have written entire huge textbooks just on this topic, but I really tried to spend time here showing you this is how I approach these things, how I look at melanocytic lesions. So I go into the basics of nevus and how to tell, you know, nevus cells down here from lymphocytes over here. I have tables talking about the features that you see typically in nevi versus features that you see typically in melanoma and whether these are features you find in the epidermis, the junctional component, or in the dermal component of the lesion. And then I show examples of those things. So here's what pagetoid spread looks like. Here's what confluent growth is. Here's confluent growth causing what we call the unzipping sign, where the epidermis is, is artifactually detaching from the dermis because there are so many melanocytes replacing the basal keratinocytes. And here's another kind of type of confluence where you have extension of melanoma in situ down a hair follicle or other adnexal structure. I think you can see it here around an eccrine duct actually too. And I go into how to measure. Um, a lot of times I see people um, at the level of a, a, maybe a surge path fellow or even in practice where they struggle to know exactly how to measure the depth or the thickness, the Breslow thickness of melanoma. So I took a picture through my ocular and showed this is exactly what I'm looking at with my micrometer and exactly how I measure from where to where to calculate the Breslow thickness of uh, an invasive melanoma because that's the most important feature that helps with understanding prognosis and helps the surgeons and oncologists know how to treat the patient. Um, I talk also about different types of nevi that tend to concern beginners or look deceptively worrisome and also melanoma variants that look deceptively benign like nevoid melanoma or desmoplastic melanoma. And I think those are really important to know about so that they're always in the back of your mind when you're looking at cases. Um, that way you don't miss them. 
Um, here's an example of the kind of melanocyte hyperplasia you can get in sun damaged skin. Really important to not confuse this with melanoma in situ. It can be very difficult on a frozen section or on margins for a melanoma in situ. And we can use stains to help us, but it's important to use the right stain. And I explain, uh, spend a lot of time explaining why I use the stains that I use to evaluate um, for different things in melanocytic pathology. I use different stains depending on whether I'm looking at the epidermis to try to see if there's confluent growth. In that setting, I use SOX10. And you can see here, this is SOX10 with nicely spaced out melanocytes, uh, spaced apart by normal keratinocytes. This is the same tissue, the same area of the same slide stained with S100, and this is why we don't use S100 to look for pagetoid spread or confluence, because it's going to highlight all these Langerhan cells and other dendritic cells and look totally dirty and messy and will be very difficult to interpret. Here's an example of a solar lens ago. To beginners, all this pigment looks like it would be melanocytes, and they might worry about melanoma in situ. But actually, these are pigmented keratinocytes, as you can see on this SOX10 stain, these are the melanocytes. Everything else here that's brown without any red nuclear staining, those are all just pigment-laden keratinocytes, which is a typical feature of solar lentigo. And I tried to cover um, controversial topics like dysplastic nevus and spitz nevus. I tried to cover these um, in, it was very hard for me to figure out how to summarize decades of controversy and argument into a few pages in a book for beginners, but I tried to do my best and explain this is what's difficult and confusing about it. Here's how I currently think of this entity and approach it in my practice, and here are some different um, viewpoints, and I tried to, to cite literature from opposing schools of thought so that the reader can go look in the literature, read different points of view, and decide for yourself what you think, but here I present to you how I approach these cases and what I think about it. There's a lot of first-person language in this book, which I know maybe some readers don't like, but I feel like this is a book written about how I currently do Dermpath personally in my practice. And I think that when I teach, that's what a lot of people want to know. Like, how do you per practically handle this? I know that that's what I really wanted to learn from my mentors. And so that's what I'm trying to pass on here to the readers in this book. And here's an example of this plastic nevus, again with arrows pointing out what bridging means and uh, fibroplasia and all of those things. But this looks kind of like dysplastic nevus too, except it's in an elderly sun damaged patient on their forehead. This is actually melanoma in situ, lentigo malignotype, which has a tendency to make nests that mimic dysplastic nevus. But you can tell not only by the clinical setting, but also by the fact that we've got confluent growth of melanocytes way down this eccrine duct, which here is a surefire um, uh, feature to tell us that this is definitely melanoma, not dysplastic nevus. I see this um, confused, this. Um, misdiagnosed and confused often by people in practice even. It's really treacherous. So I tried to cover those pitfalls in the book. And the last pitfall I'll show, with practice you can recognize this from 2x, from low magnification, until proven otherwise, this is one thing and one thing only. And uh, this is a scalp excision, and you can see this whole thing we're looking at is tumor. It's infiltrated through the fat all the way down to the galea, the, the fascia right above the skull. And you can see a little bit of fat left over, but most of the subcutis is blown away. And the most important thing, lymphoid aggregates. These clues, these, these lymphocytes, uh, Dr. Rapini said they're like smart bombs. They can see that this lesion's bad. And that's because at higher power, you can see the scattered atypia the collagen and myxoid background between the tumor cells, and this would be diffusely positive on SOX and S100, it's desmoplastic melanoma. Rare, but so easy to misdiagnose, particularly on a shave biopsy where you don't have very much of the tumor present. So important to always think of this entity. So that's just a sample. I think there are, uh, if I recall, about 700 pictures, and I've shown you just a handful of them, and uh, this will really give you a flavor of what the book's like, and I hope you'll consider buying a copy uh, you can purchase the book, uh, pre-order currently, at InnovativeSciencePress.com slash new dash releases. You can see the web address up here, and I'll add a link down below if you want to buy it. Of course, conflict of interest, if you buy this, I actually will make some royalty payments on this, so I do have a financial stake in this book, and also I made the book, so I'm completely biased about it, but I still wanted to share with you what's inside it so you can decide for yourself if you think it'll be worthwhile for your practice. And uh, please also keep in mind that there are other survival guides. This is a whole series that we're just getting started on. I co-authored this uh, soft tissue survival guide 
with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Montgomery and Dr. Alicia Ware. That came out um, uh, back in December. Uh, there's also a GI, Mucosal Biopsy Survival Guide, and other survival guides in the works um, uh, coming up. So please keep an eye on this page if you like the idea of this survival guide series. Uh, these books are all aimed to be just like my Dermpath book. P lots of pictures, lots of practical text, um, a place to, to read and then hit the ground running when you're just starting out on your first rotation in this specialty or when you're in practice and you need a refresher on the basics of a certain organ system uh, pathology. So thanks again for watching and uh, letting me share my excitement about this book uh, with you. I, I'm so excited and I can't wait uh, for all of you to get a copy and uh, please let me know what you think down in the comments and if you'll if you consider writing an honest review um, even if you don't like it that's fine too on amazon.com that would be so great because that would really help um, other people to recognize that the book's helpful if you find it helpful and hopefully they'll purchase it as well uh, thanks again for uh, for everything and the book should be out in September 2019